Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you so much for uh, today. Lord, may this message be uh, inspired by you. Remove me, and it may be your words and not mine. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So, uh, <coughs> the portion of the... Uh, the portion of scripture that I want to focus on is right there in Hebrews 12, verses 6 through 11. And it says, My son, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. If ye endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the Father chasteneth not? But if ye be without chastisement, whereof, whereof all, are, all are partakers, then ye are bastards and not sons. Furthermore, we have had fathers of our flesh, which corrected us, and we gave them reverence. Shall we not much rather be in subjection unto the Father of spirits and live? For they verily for a few days chastened us after their own pleasure, but he for our profit, that we might be partakers of his holiness. Now no chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous, but grievous. Nevertheless, afterwards it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. And the title of my message today is, For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth. And uh, the reason that I'm preaching this is, this week, and actually it's been uh, the last couple of weeks, one of the things that, one of the doctors that you don't hear preached a lot in the contemporary or modern churches is the uh, doctrine of God chastening us or correcting us and because we don't talk about it we don't correct church members or our children or our brothers in Christ or uh, you know uh, people in the uh, elders or even preachers and the challenge that we run into with that is that when you're out there soul winning what happens is most people will answer or at least this week and it's a, but it is a common thing that we run into is most people when you ask them you know do you believe if you die today that you're hundred percent sure that you're going to heaven and they say yeah you ask them well what is it that you place your belief in and most of the time they'll answer well we believe in Jesus Christ that's great and the follow-up question always is you know is there anything that you think that you can do to lose your salvation at least that's my presentation and uh, they're like well yeah you can have a big sin or you can do something and then even and then slowly if they give the opportunity we can go through the gospel and even when you show them the eternal security of the believer one of the challenges that you find is that there's always that but oh I believe in Jesus but and I really, I really believe the reason is is that there's not a healthy fear of Christ and there's not a healthy understanding that once you're in his family he's not gonna let you just get away with anything because then you know one of the arguments you get as you're doing this presentation, as you're going through the gospel presentation, it's like, well, so you're saying that all I have to do is believe in Jesus Christ, have faith on Him, and then if I murder after that, I'm going to heaven. Well, the answer is yes. But the actual presentation also requires us to go through and explain that we are His children and that He is going to punish us or chastise us for our sin. You know, on this life, we could go to jail or, you know, if, if we get away with it for a short term, something's going to happen. God's going to make sure that we get chastised for our sin. And that's just not the sin of murder, but any sin. And it's also important because as we grow in the ministry, we have to realize that sometimes things that happen in our life, maybe they're tests, maybe they're trials, but also they could be a chastening for something that we have done. And uh, we don't want to do that. You know, that, that's the modern... Uh, gospel message is Jesus is everything but you still can do all these things because you have all the power and the reality is God has all the power and God is the one who grants us you know the increase and God is also the one who can hold us back and God is the one who is going to correct us and God's the one who's going to show us the way and the cha and most of the time we're writing goals and we're taking from the world and we're we're saying oh we can do this or we can do that and if I sin, I can fix it, and I can do this, and that, can, uh, that maintains my goal to get into heaven. As a matter of fact, I was talking to a young man earlier this morning, and he's like, I've been saved many times. And that's not true at all. But the thing is, I don't think that they understand that chastening part. See, if you understand that you can be uh, held accountable for your sin, then it makes sense that God can save you once and for all and adopt you into his family, 
But you're not going to get away with everything. It's not required for salvation, but it is required to live a better life here on earth. And that's really should be our goal, is that once we get saved or lead others to Christ, that we would want them to grow in Christ. That we would want them to remove the sin from their life. That we would want them to stop doing the things of the world. But we can't do that if we're not preaching what God tells us to preach. So the, the first thing that I, the reason that I'm doing it is that most important for me is soul winning. And, you know, if you don't understand chastening in God's context, in the biblical context, then soul winning is really difficult because you don't know how to overcome that, that excuse. You know, when every time I get that excuse, whether it's, you know, oh, you can murder and then get away with it, or uh, I have to fix whatever, yeah, you just use the example of your children and or someone else's children, if you don't have children, and that example is, you know, my children can sin and they can misbehave and do things, but I will spank them, you know, I will chasten them, but they don't stop being my children. You know, once you're in God's uh, fold, you're not going to stop being his child. That doesn't mean you get away with everything. And so, you know, uh, let's go to Acts 2, verse 21. Let's go to Acts 2, verse 21, and let's just take a look at one verse on the soul winning, because I think it's real important that we understand chastening so that we can know how to explain it to others when we're out there giving our soul winning gospel because everything that we do, everything that we learn is to lead people to Christ and then afterwards to help them grow in the ministry. And so if you look at Acts 2 verse 21, it says, And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Why did I just focus on that specifically? Well, that's all it takes to be saved. That's all that you need is to call upon the name of the Lord. And I know that we know a bunch of other verses. The reason I use that verse specifically is because it's just another verse in the gospel that tells you that all you need to do is call upon the name of the Lord to be saved. And so there is no, well, I'm saved, but I've got to keep the commandments. It didn't say, and it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord and ask for forgiveness after all their sins and stop drinking caffeine or stop eating unclean meats or go on the Sabbath or whatever. It just says, and it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. So it's very simple. When we're out there soul winning, we have to maintain the main thing, the main thing, which is salvation is by grace through faith. But living for Christ, that's a whole other deal. And when you're doing that, it comes with, with uh, its own set of rules. And so once you're saved, you're his child. You're no longer a bastard, as the Bible says, and he will hold you accountable, whether it be in this life or in eternity. And the way that, uh, that I understand the Bible is in eternity, you know, we're working for rewards and crowns and recognition. Some of us are going to have more. Some of us are going to have less. But that doesn't make you less saved. It's just you're not in that hierarchy of Christ, right? Let's look at Hebrews 12. Let's go to verse 12 and 15. Uh, and it says, Wherefore, lift up the hands which hang down and the feeble knees, and make straight paths for your feet, lest that which is lame be turned out of the way, but let it be rather, but let it rather be healed. Follow peace with all men and holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord, looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God. Lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. And I think this is a soul winning set of verses. It's saying, look, stop trying to fix things yourself. God's chastening you. And when he does, then let's get, let's get a couple of things straight. Lift up the hands which hang down and the feeble knees. In other words, don't be that mopey guy because you, you're, you're uh, Mr. Guilt. You're not a Catholic who can guilt yourself into submission and you can convince yourself that if you beat yourself enough or if you say enough uh, Hail Marys or whatever they're called, that then you can lead a righteous life. God says, look, I've chastened you. Stay focused on the main thing because this is referring to, it says, make straight path, paths for your feet, lest that which is lame be turned out of the way, but let it rather be healed. Follow peace with all men, all men, and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord, looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God. In other words, 
God's grace is there, but you're trying to do everything yourself. It says, lest any root of bitterness, here's the dangers, then you get a root of bitterness springing up, trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. And I think that that's what, what the Lord's saying here is, look, if you allow yourself to get this attitude where you think that you know better, where you think that you know how to correct yourself, or the but in the salvation, but I'm going to follow the commandments, and but I'm going to do this, then you're running a dangerous ground. And you're doing one of two things. You're going to feel really guilty, and you're going to be depressed, and you're not going to go out and do the things. And that's what happens, right? The, the, the devil is the accuser of the brethren. And I've heard people say, what gives you the right as a preacher, any preacher to get up there? Because you're a sinner just like me. Yeah, but God appointed preachers. If I sat here and I moped about all the times that I've sinned and all the things that I've done, I'd never do anything. But I know it's by God's grace that I'm up here, and I know He's taking care of the things that I need to do. And He also gives me free will. He says, look, you lift up the hands. Wherefore, lift up the hands which hang down and the feeble knees. That's to my responsibility to get up and go do the work. It's my responsibility to stay focused on the task. And, you know, we do have that choice, right? We can flee idolatry or we can have the lust of the eyes and the lust of the flesh. And I really think it affects the soul winning because the more I talk to people, the more I realize they have the first part of the gospel right. They understand that Jesus is the way, but not completely. You know, it's like saying, um, I understand how a car works. And then somebody asks me, well, how does it work? Well, you turn the ignition and you press on the gas pedal and you put it on driver reverse and you go. Well, that's not understanding how a car works. That's having an idea that you know a few key components on how to get from point A to point B. But if you talk to that engineer or that uh, mechanical engineer that put that car together, he understands how it works. He knows what that ignition does and how it creates a spark. And I'm not going to go into it because I'm probably going to sound really ignorant. But that's the difference. And so point number one is that it affects your soul winning. And we need to have the doctrine of chastening preached so when we're out soul winning, people understand the difference between grace and grace but. Because there's a lot of grace but. Salvation is free but. But whatever, they're going to say the commandments, or you, got, uh, you do a mortal sin, or the seven cardinal sins, which, by the way, the seven cardinal sins is nowhere in the Bible. That's a Catholic thing, and it's nowhere to be found in God. The Bible talks about all sin, not just the seven cardinal sins, which I'm not going to go into. But let's look at uh, point number two. How does chastening affect our lives, us as, as uh, Christians, us as those children of God? Go to Psalm 94, verse 12. Turn to, turn to Psalm 94, verse 12. 94, verse 12. And in Psalm 94, verse 12, the Bible tells us, Blessed is the man whom thou chastenest, O Lord, and teachest him out of thy law. So one of the things that's real important is, look, yeah, you can get saved, and if you murder, you still go to heaven. But you know what I'd rather have? I'd rather be saved and start learning the way of the Lord and have him correct me because it says, Blessed is the man whom thou chastenest, O Lord, and teachest him out of thy law. And one of the things that soul winning has done in my life, whether it was when I was 25 and I got saved, I, I got the soul winning bug. I didn't have it like I have it now where we go door to door because I didn't understand that concept. You know, I'm still learning the Bible, but I've always wanted to soul win. And, you know, I'd do it one-on-one, -on -one, and I'd do it at work, and I'd do it, you know, if I was in a car, uh, uh, traveling somewhere, if I was on a plane. Th that message has always been there. But one of the things that soul winning weekly, that soul winning door-to-door, uh, -door, that you go out there into the hedges and the highways does, is that it helps look at your life, and it keeps you humble and focused on the things that are important. Because you know that when you're out there in the hedges and the highways, if you haven't perched the iniquity from you, you're not going to yield fruit. But how do you do that? Well, when God chastens you, that's a blessing. And it teaches you, and He's going to teach you out of His law. I mean, think about how much scripture we have to either memorize or know where to go look to be able to respond to the attacks of the devil or to the, those who are under conviction and are ready to accept Jesus Christ. Go back to Hebrews 12, and just keep your finger there, because we will be going back and forth. But if you go back to Hebrews 12, uh, go back to Hebrews 12, and look at verse 6 and verse 7. It says, For whom the Lord loveth, so the Lord has to love you, 
That means that if the Lord loves you, then He also can hate things. That's just an aside note because a lot of people say, well, the Lord can't hate anything. Well, you, in order to love something, you have to hate certain things, right? It says, for the Lord, for whom the Lord loveth, He chasteneth and scourgeth every son who He receiveth. If ye endure, ch if ye endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the Father chasteneth not? In other words, God's going to make sure he takes care of business. But I would much rather he chasten me as his son. So when people are asking, and I'm going back to so many, but when people are asking this stuff, you know, it's interesting because what he's saying is, I'm going to make sure that if you're seeking me, you're going to lead a righteous life. And that's not saying that you're perfect. I mean, that's a, that should be a given, but unfortunately, that's not. You know, the other challenge you run into when you're soul winning is people say, oh, yeah, I got saved. Okay, great. And I've never sinned anymore in my life. Because that's the other thing about not understanding the Bible is you have the two spectrums, right? One, everybody thinks they have to get saved or accept Jesus, but. And it's a but of a bunch of stuff they have to do. Or, I'm saved, and now I that's it. I've just stopped sinning. And some of them say it directly. I've actually run into people that say, oh, I, I haven't sinned in 20 years or I haven't sinned in X number of years. But others just kind of leave that hint that they're saved and because they're saved, God changed them or that repent of your sins group that says, look, if you don't have a change, you're not saved. Well, look, you don't have to have a change. God will take care of that over the time. And if you were to meet me when I was 25, I'm now 38. If you would have met me when I first got saved to what I do now, you know, my life's changed a lot. But it wasn't an immediate thing. I, I didn't know the Word like I know now. I didn't believe the things that I believe now because I, I hadn't read it through and through as many times as I have now. So it's important for our lives to get the blessing of chastening. You know, the, if you look there in the verses 6 and 7 of uh, Hebrews, I, I have a note here, and it says, you know, the Lord makes a kind of a blanket statement that this is a common thing even of the world. It says, So an unruly and unwilling parents are rebellious of God, even by common world standards. And what, what I, the point I'm trying to make there is, if you, let's go back to verse 6 and 7 so I don't confuse the issue. It says, For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. If ye endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the Father chasteneth not? And then if we look a little bit further, let's just go down to verse 8. It says, But if ye be without chastisement, where whereof all are partakers, then ye are bastards and not sons. But what the point is, he's making that comparison to look, even those worldly fathers chasing their sons, even the world understands that discipline, that if your kids are misbehaving, you're going to discipline them. And so it's interesting that that's just been a common theme throughout world history. And, I mean, you, you can talk to anybody who's older, and you can even talk to me, and you always get that one group of generation that says, well, you know, if I messed up, my dad would have whooped me for that. Or if I would have done that, I would have never gotten away with that. I mean, you just talk to anybody over time, and that's always been a thing. People still spank their kids here in the U.S., uh, in, the, in America, even if they're not saved. That's a common thing to discipline your children. I mean, that's not going to go away anytime soon. But what God's saying here is, when I do it, when God does it, it's a blessing. Let's go to, or, or stay there in Hebrews. I'm just going to go to Proverbs 3, verse 11 through 12. It says, My son, despise not the chastening of the Lord, neither be weary of his correction. For whom the Lord loveth, he correcteth, even as the father of the son in whom he delighteth. So the love of the Lord is the correction in us. And, it, and it's, he's asking us not to not only not to despise or hate it, and also not to get tired of it. You know, we shouldn't treat it like when our parents got on to us. You know, sometimes when my dad disciplined me as I was getting older, it was weary. And I got annoyed. And I even maybe despised it. You know, I can't remember a specific event in my life that that happened. But I'm pretty sure I remember being young and I was pretty unruly towards my parents. But here it says, for whom the Lord loveth, he corrected, even as a father, the son in whom he delighted. So it's a good thing for God to direct our paths, for God to scourge us, to, to chasten us, and to show us His way. And so, in our lives, it's a blessing.
So point number one is it's important to know the doctrine of chastening for soul winning. It's also important to know that it's a blessing in our lives so we don't look at it as a negative but as a positive. Because the other thing, you know, that's one of the things I've learned from my wife. My wife got saved when she was three years old and one of the things I've learned from her is, you know, sometimes I'll do something and the immediate reaction is, uh, or sometimes something will happen in my life or in our life. And my immediate reaction when we were younger was, well, God's doing this to us because of X, Y, and C. She's like, that's not the way it works. You know, we should never play God because we don't know what's going on, right? What we need to do is focus on the ministry. Focus on the things because sometimes the trials come because we're doing a good work, like Job. You know, Job didn't eschew evil and he says, have thou considered my son uh, Job to Satan? Sometimes things happen because God is chastening us. And he's leading us on the path. But the big thing is it's all for our benefit. It's all for our profit and his profit. Actually, really, it's all for his profit so that we can continue to grow in the Word, so we can continue to plant the seed, so we can continue to go out there and lead souls to Christ and do the things for the Lord. Let's look at point number three. What, how does chastening affect our children or our family? Not just uh, our children as they're growing up, but once we become a, a family uh, where you know you have multiple children and now they're growing up, they're getting ready to get married and things like that. Let's look at Proverbs. And you can stay in uh, Hebrews because I'm going to jump around in Proverbs. There's a lot to, to say about that. In Proverbs 13, verse 24, he says, He that spareth his rod hateth his son, but he that loveth him chasteneth him betimes. And so... I love this verse because people, you know, I've heard people and I've actually heard family members of mine say, oh, you know, so-and-so was really tough on me growing up and I don't want to leave that psychological impact on my children, so I just don't spank them. We talk them through. And the Bible says, look, if you spare the rod, you hate the child. And I love my children, so I don't want to spare that rod. So what does chastening mean for us? Is look, if we're going to accept God's chastening in our lives, we have to then also obey Him when He says we have to chasten our children. It says, but I love, He says, but he that loveth Him chasteneth Him betimes. In other words, a lot. Make sure that we correct them. And children are like that. As they get older, they're going to, they're going to get opinions. And they're going to think they know things. And it's our duty as parents to make them realize that's not the case. Well, one of the ways to do it is not, hey, uh, Jimmy or Timmy or Enriquito or whatever, uh, let's talk about it. Let's work this out. You Here's a choice of consequences and figure out which one you want to pick. Not a two-year-old or a three-year-old or a five-year-old. Even sometimes not even an eight or ten-year-old. Just spank them. It's real easy because then they understand that, that correction. I remember uh, some of the most, uh, I guess, poignant times in my life or some of the biggest moments in my life growing up that made an impact where I learned something was when I got spanked. You know, the, the time, I remember the time that I got in trouble. I don't even remember what I got in trouble for, but I remember going back uh, a few days before or a few months before. I can't specifically tell you, but I remember we would go to Mexico across the border into Reynosa and we would go to the plaza and we'd eat uh, we'd, we'd eat all the tacos and ice cream and we'd shop around because it was real cheap. And I remember one time specifically, it stood out in my mind, my dad went around to every one of the leather shops because leather is real popular in Mexico. And he was looking for a belt and he kept asking everybody and specifically, it didn't, it wasn't registering why he was so specific because my dad always had belts. So he got this real thick belt. I remember he bought it. It was, he made a big deal about it. And then that was it. We never heard of the belt or anything ever again. And then a couple of, of weeks, months, late, whatever. There's a time forward later, we, we got in trouble. I don't even remember what I got in trouble for, me and my brother. All I remember was that now I knew what the belt was for because my dad said, son, go get me the belt. And I remember, because it was such an insignificant moment, I remember I went to the closet and I grabbed my dad's regular belt. I came back and I'm like, here, dad, here's the belt. I knew I was going to get spanked. And he's like, no, no, that's not the belt. The one I bought. So we found out later that he specifically bought that belt to spank us. But it, what's interesting is whatever it was that we did, I don't think we did it again because I can't even remember what it was anymore. That's how significant not sparing the rod is. All right? Let's look at Proverbs 29, verse 17. It says, correct thy son, and he shall give thee rest. Yea, he shall give delight unto thy soul. 
You know, you ever go to a restaurant or even church sometimes and you, you see those parents and just let their kids do everything? They look tired, they're worn out, they're frustrated. You know, I personally have family members who have children like that, and when they come over, it's almost a burden to have them over because they leave your house a mess and nobody ever tells them anything. You know, one of the things we appreciate, and by the way, when I make this statement, my kids are young and we have them on a schedule, I'm not but I do want to have a discipline for them. One of the things that we do do, that we're very strict on is their bedtimes. And guess what? When they go to bed early, after a long day of working with them and playing with them and feeding them and changing them and doing all that, it is nice to get some rest from all that. Because I know children in my family that are up at all hours of the day and their nap time's at one o'clock in the morning. And so they've been up since till midnight or one and then they sleep for two hours and they're up from two to four. And the individuals that are involved, they're just not getting any rest. And they don't wanna deal with you and they don't wanna be with you and they're mean and they're grumpy. And so the Bible says very clearly, correct thy son and he shall give thee rest. Yea, he shall give delight unto thy soul. Let's look at Proverbs 22, 15. It says, Foolishness is bound in the heart of a child, but the rod of correction shall drive it far from him. You ever meet that one child, especially boys? They get old enough to just get on top of furniture and, and they just start jumping off of things, no matter how high they are. Man, if you just get that rod of correction, they're not going to jump off of stuff anymore. They'll understand that that's dangerous. See, because it's not enough to say, hey, that's a dangerous thing you're doing. If you spank it out of them, you know, they'll get the point. Proverbs 23, 13, and 14 says, Withhold not correction from the child, for thou beatest him with the rod, he shall not die. Thou shalt beat him with the rod, and shall deliver his soul from hell. So there is a correlation with disciplining your children and teaching them the doctrine of chastisement and how it convicts them to lead them to the Lord. You know, there... That fear, that healthy fear of parents also creates a healthy fear of the Lord. You know, my dad and my mom, I believe my mom said, I don't think my dad is saved. Which, by the way, if anybody ever meets my dad, lead him to the Lord. I don't want him to go to hell. But one of the things that led me to the Lord is, you know, I've, I understood fear because I've, growing up, I feared my dad. There's no scarier words than when my mom said, okay, I've had enough with you guys. I'm going to tell your dad when he gets home. And we never got away with it. You know, I remember one, one time specifically, uh, I don't know what we did, we got in trouble, and, and my dad was busy because he's a doctor, and he's always traveled back and forth to Mexico, and so he wasn't gonna get home early. So we went to bed early, my mom said, when your dad gets home, I'm gonna tell him. And uh, I remember it was late at night, and I just saw that door opening and the light coming in, and he woke us up, and he said, you know, your mom told me that you guys were bad, and I can't let you get away with it, so I'm gonna wake you up. And in Spanish, there's a saying that says, los uh, van a dormir calientitos, which means you're going to sleep warm tonight. And the reason he was saying that was because whenever, if you've ever gotten spanked really good, especially with a belt, that area you got spanked in on your hiney was real warm. And so that's what he meant. He said, I'm going to let you sleep warm tonight. And he, but the big thing is, because I had that fear of the Lord, I mean, of my parents, I have that fear of the Lord. You know, so I don't want the Lord to have to chastise me hard. I'd rather him correct my steps as I go than do something like murder, which is the excuse you get when you're soul winning, and have him throw me in jail for, all, uh, for the rest of my life over something stupid. So getting saved will, will keep you from murder? I don't know, but chances are it probably will. You know, so let's go to the next point, which is how does chastening affect church members? See, we gotta, we got to look at all the points because at the end of the day, that's how it leads to the soul winning. That's how it leads to growing the church. That's how it leads to fellowship with Christ and brothers and sisters in Christ. Uh, it, Deuteronomy verses 8 and 5, you know, the Lord's talking to the, the children of Israel and it says, Thou shalt also consider in thine heart that as a man chasteneth his son, so the Lord thy God chasteneth thee. So the Lord will chasten us as a, as a church if we're not supportive of certain things. It says, Therefore thou shalt keep the commandments of the Lord thy God to walk in his ways and fear him. Just recently, uh, our head pastor, Pastor Cobb, was, uh, had an issue with one of the church members he called me about. I'm not at liberty to say, plus it doesn't make any point. But what made me angry was that they were trying to circumvent a couple of things 
to get a desired result. And it's within the rules and the context of what Pastor Cobb has set forth. And the Bible is saying here, look, thou shalt consider in thy heart that as a man chasteneth his son, so the Lord God chasteneth thee. And he's talking to, to a congregation, but also to us personally. Right? Thee is one. He chasteneth us. So if we're not doing the things in the congregation that are correct, if we don't act the proper way, and the Bible gives us a specific formula or a specific set of instructions for how to be in the Lord's house, He's going to correct us. It says, Therefore thou shalt keep the commandments of the Lord thy God to walk in His ways and to fear Him. And one of the things that's really important is that if you have a man of God, especially here, you know, I, I assist Pastor Cobb. He ordained me. Uh, he has a plan and a goal for me. But Pastor Cobb is the leader and the pastor of this church. And as a congregation, there is a certain level of respect and honor that we give him for being a man of God, ordained and chosen and anointed by God. And when church members do that, then it's, it's our requirement as a church to support the man of God. Not the person who has the drama and who's bad-mouthing or trying to circumvent the system or do certain things. It's our duty to stand behind the man of God. And what's interesting is that today in America, I mean, you see it all over, whether it's in TV, whether it's on Facebook, whether it's on YouTube or social media or in your homes, the, the, squeaky, the squeaky wheel is the one that gets the oil. Most people tend to be like, oh, wow, they're bad-mouthing that church. That church must be real bad. And nobody's ever done any research. Nobody's ever found out. And most of the time, that person bad-mouthing the church was trying to get away with something, and they held them accountable. And, and, and instead of standing with the men of God or with the men and women of God, most times, people just follow the other way. You know why I think it is? It's because nobody wants to get chastened by God. And so they'd rather justify that sin so that they can justify their sins. You know, the way that it is, is I always learned leadership works like this, right? If you have the leader... The person following is only going to do this much. And then if they're following this guy or this woman, they're going to do this much. And so that's why you see things like fornication and divorce and alcohol and not preaching hard uh, be rampant in the modern church. Because, you know, the leader here, he's drinking. He might not be a drunk, although it leads to drunkenness. Eventually, they, they will be drunk. I'm, not, I'm just using this as an example. And that leader is the pastor or whatever. And so everybody says, well, if he drinks, then I can get drunk. Or if he says it's not bad to drink, even though he doesn't drink, then I can really do so. so or whatever. Oh, the past, that guy got divorced, but he's still leading the church. Oh, that's okay. Then I'll get married and divorced. Because God wants it in my life. I remember one time, uh, he, this guy was a good friend of mine for many, many years. And then after this conversation, we, we've never talked again. Uh, he came up to me. He was a married man at the time, and he came up to me and told me he was in love with my sister. And, and I told him, I said, I don't know what your problem is. Like, you've got a wife. He's like, well, I really believe that God's told me that I need to leave my wife to be happy. And I showed him all the verses on divorce. I'm not going to go into it. But that's what happens, right? Why do people think like that? Because there's congregations and there's church leaders and there's false prophets that are preaching that crap. And they're out there justifying that crap. And so for us, for church members, there has to be a unity and, and there has to be a support for when we're chastened as a congregation or one of us is being chastened. Right? Look at uh, Jeremiah 2, uh, verses 13 through uh, 19. This is more of a side note, but it has to do with the, with the message of chastening, and it's backing you know, the, the, the Jews or the synagogue of Satan and kind of kissing their hiney. And the Bible tells us, look, let's, let's look at how God backs people that don't back him. Right? Jeremiah 2, verse 13 says, For my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and hewed them out cisterns, broken cisterns that can hold no water. Is Israel a servant? Is he a home-born slave? Why is he spoiled? The young lions roared upon him and yelled, and they made his land waste. His cities are burned without inhabitant. Also the children of Noph and Taphanes have broken the crown of thy head. Has thou not procured this unto thyself? If, thou, if that that thou hast forsaken the Lord thy God, when he led thee by the way, and now was that thou 
to do in the way of Egypt, to drink the waters of Sihor? Or what hast thou to do in the way of Assyria, to drink the waters of the river? Thine own wickedness shall correct thee, and thy backsliding shall reprove thee. Now therefore, and see that it is an evil thing and bitter that thou hast forsaken the Lord thy God, and that my fear is not in thee, saith the Lord of hosts. And so what God's allowing is their wickedness to correct them. See, I made mention of this earlier this morning, but I'm going to say it again. Is I know that there's like Baptists for Jewish nation, and there's Pentecostals for the Jews, and I think Trump's behind Israel, and I think European nations are behind Israel. But God... He's not behind his people or any people if they're backslidden, first of all. But number two, they have to first be his children. But uh, the nation of Israel, the Jews, hate God. And so they've been forsaken. They've been given up. And I'm going to prove that to you here in the Bible. Or they've actually, they're condemned already. And not all of them, by the way. I'm not making it. I'm just saying anybody who hates God is probably close to being a reprobate or or they're borderline and we really need to preach the gospel and not make them feel like they're God's chosen people and that they can get away with anything. Because that's not biblical. You know, we justify as a nation all the sin of the Jewish people because of like Genesis 12, 13, when in reality God never justified it. In all his writings, if the people backslid, he chastened them. He corrected them. Let's look at Jeremiah 30. Jeremiah has a lot to say about correction, but let's look at Jeremiah 30 you know, as a whole. Verse 1 says, The word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, Thus speaketh the Lord God of Israel, saying, Write thee all the words that I have spoken unto thee in a book. For lo, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will bring again the captivity of my people Israel and Judah, saith the Lord. And I will cause them to return to the land that I gave to their fathers, and they shall possess it. And these are the words that the Lord spake concerning Israel and concerning Judah. For thus saith the Lord, We have heard a voice of a trembling, of fear, and not of peace. As ye know, and see whether a man doth travail with child, wherefore do I see every man with his hands on his loins, as a woman in travail, and all the faces are turned into paleness. Alas, for the day is great, so that none is like it. It is even the time of Jacob's trouble, but he shall be saved out of it. For it shall come to pass in that day, saith the Lord of hosts, that I will break his yoke from off thy neck, and I will burst thy bonds. And strangers shall no, shall no more serve themselves of him, but they shall serve the Lord their God and David their king, whom I will raise up unto them. Therefore fear thou not, O my servant Jacob, saith the Lord. Neither be dismayed, O Israel, for lo, I will save thee from afar, and thy seed from the land of their captivity. And Jacob shall return, and shall be in rest, and be quiet, and none shall make him afraid. For I am with thee, saith the Lord, to save thee. Though I make a full end of nations, whether I have scattered thee, yet I will not make a full end of thee. But I will correct thee in measure, and will not leave thee altogether unpunished. So see, even when, when things look like they're, they're bad or when things look like they're tough, if you're his child, he's doing it to correct you, but not to leave you, right? But altogether unpunished. It says, yet will I not make a full end of thee, but I will correct thee in measure. In other words, hold you accountable to what you did wrong, but I will and will not leave thee altogether unpunished. And this is a pot like this is bringing them back. This is a positive. I'm not going to go into all this, but this is a positive set of verses. But he's reminding them that before that there has to be the correction. See, most of the times we want all the glory without any of the hurt, right? Without any of the work. That's the problem with our society, right? Everybody wants a paycheck without any work, or everybody wants a reward without any of the effort, or everybody wants a gold medal without any of the competition. Well, that, that's the other thing with Christianity, though. We want all the glory without any of the correction. You know, God, we love you. Jesus is the way. We, we want to serve you. Hallelujah. Amen. But no chastening, no correction, no discipline. Love, love everybody. Let's talk it through. Let's all be peaceful. Let's all hold hands and sing Kumbaya, my Lord. You know, all that stuff. And the reality is God's going to hold us accountable. And then let's just look at what it means for the world, right? The world is considered bastards. 
You know, nobody wants to be a bastard, and the Bible says that you are like bastards in, in, in uh, Hebrews 12. And we'll go back to that here. Let's go back to Hebrews 12, verse 8. It says, But if ye be without chastisement, whereof, are, whereof all are partakers, then ye are bastards and not sons. So when someone says, Yes, I believe in Jesus, but I have to do these things. No, you don't, because you consider yourself a bastard. When you believe in Jesus, you're part of his family. It's all by grace. Right? Let's go back, let's go down to verse 17. It says, For ye know how that afterwards, that afterward, when he would have inherited the blessing, he was rejected. For he found no place of repentance, though he sought it carefully with tears. What's interesting to me is that, you know, I, it doesn't say that explicitly there, but it, it looks like the, the same issue that we have today in modern society, we, they've had then. It sounds like they were preaching repentance for salvation. And he says, like, look, though he sought it carefully with tears. In other words, that's what happens. You ever meet a good Catholic? I mean, oh, Lord, and they'll, they'll grab the little crucifix and Lord, and they whip themselves. But it says, look, you, you sought it for nothing. It says, for ye know that afterward, when he would have inherited the blessing, he was rejected. For he found no place of repentance, though he sought it carefully with tears. See, repentance has its place, but not for salvation. It's for correction. If God corrects us, we should repent. If we're doing something we shouldn't do and God chastises us, then we should turn from that thing that we're doing. And we should stop. Whatever it is. You know, I, I'm not. There's no specific thing I'm thinking about, but that's any sin in our life. Let's just pick a simple sin like lying. If God corrects us in our lying, we should repent from lying and not lie anymore. But that doesn't lead you to salvation. Let's go to uh, Proverbs 15 uh, verse 9 through 11. It says, The way of the wicked is an abomination. And turn to John 3, 16 actually. And I'll just read Proverbs 15 for the, for the sake of time. It says, The way of the wicked is an abomination unto the Lord. But he that loveth him that followeth after righteousness. Correction is grievous unto him that forsaketh the way, and he that hateth reproof shall die. Hell and destruction are before the Lord. How much more than the hearts of the children of men? I think it's interesting that the Bible talks here that when God corrects the world, they think it's grievous, and they forsake the way, and he hateth reproof shall die. And I don't think it's talking about just the physical death, but it's talking about the second death. And I can prove that because the next verse is, Hell and destruction are before the Lord. And so when you're a bastard, you're condemned already. You know, John 3, 16 through 18 are some of the most famous verses. But most of the time when you hear people quote them, they'll quote John 3, 16. They'll quote 17. And they won't touch 18. You know, and we know the verses, right? For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. That's great. And we use that verse in our soul winning. It says, for God, and then the next one, when you're talking about, you know, God can give up a reprobate, or He can give you up, or cast you into hell, the, the, right away people are real quick to be like, well, for God sent not His Son into the world to condemn the world, but the, that the world through Him might be saved. Exactly. His son, Jesus Christ. Perfect. I'm with you all the way. But let's read 18. He says, He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. I think that's a great soul winning verse. When people want to argue all the works and, and the, the buts and all the things that they want to do, look, there is none. You're condemning yourself. And you're conde Actually, you remain in condemnation when you don't believe on Jesus Christ. When you don't believe that it's by grace alone. When you don't believe that it's uh, through Him only. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. And th those are Jesus' words. You know, and let's just conclude. So let's just recap real quick. Chastisement is important, or the doctrine of chastisement is important for soul winning. Because it's not an easy out. Easy believism is not an easy out. God cannot change his nature, you know, for our lives. It's important that he chastises so that we can grow in his grace and we can do more for the Lord, right? For our children, 
so that we can raise them in the fear and admonition of our Lord for the church so that we can be in one accord and continue to focus on the main thing instead of letting gossip and bitterness and unruliness you know take over and then we don't know where we're headed you know we're like a well, like a chicken with their heads cut off. And then we understand it because it does separate us from the world. We're either chastised because we're his children or we're punished into eternal damnation because we're part of the world. And, you know, and, I, and there's nothing that makes me happier with this message. And actually, it's been a good message for me to know that I am his son and that I'm not a bastard and that anybody who we've led to the Lord is no longer a bastard. And yeah, he's going to chastise us and yeah, he's going to correct us and he's going to scourge us, but it's a blessing for us, right? And let's go to 2 Timothy. It's a famous verse. It's used a lot, uh, you know, in, in, uh, in everything. I mean, you know, a lot of preaching. But for us here right now, it's important because this is the whole word, right? It says, all Scripture, 2 Timothy 3.16 says, All Scripture. That means chastisement is part of all Scripture. It's given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine. So the doctrine of chastisement is profitable for reproof. So we, when we get chastised, when we get corrected, He gives us the authority to then use His Word to correct. And there's a big difference, though, between I'm telling someone what to do based on my opinion and I'm telling a brother and sister what not to do or what to do based on the Word of God. You know, it's my responsibility as a preacher to preach against these things because he says it's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. For correction, for instruction in righteousness. And I can think of several examples, you know. There are times where we can lose some of the rewards, even here on earth, some of the blessings, that doesn't take away the salvation. You know, and the, uh, Moses was a man that followed God, spoke with God on the mountain. As a matter of fact, when Miriam and uh, Aaron spoke negatively because he married the Ethiopian, God made sure to remind them that he spoke directly with Moses, not with them. But Moses didn't go to the promised land because he had to get corrected. He had to get uh, chastised for striking the rock twice, right? David was a man after God's own heart and he lost his son for the murder and the adulterous affair he had with Bathsheba. You know? I mean, and I'm not going to go into the stories, those are separate sermons. Peter, the crow, uh, uh, I mean, the cock, the, yeah, the, the rooster crew, crow, Three times. And I'm sorry. Like that's how you know my English ain't the best sometimes. But but Peter, basically Peter denied Christ three times, and then the rooster crowed, and he realized it. He was chastised, and it hurt him, but it made him stronger for the ministry. You know. So there's certain times where we're just we don't know when we're going to do it, what, what's going to happen. But what we have to do is be willing to accept it. What did Moses say? When he wasn't allowed into the promised land, he said, I don't want to go without you. You know, and I'm not going to go into that whole thing because I don't, I don't want to butcher, but Moses would have rather not gone into the promised land without Christ, without God, because he knew that his reward was eternal in heaven. I mean, think about how many thousands of years Moses has been in heaven now. So even though he never saw that promised land, he's been in the promised land for a long time and as, as the Bible says, for all eternity. So let's go ahead and just remind ourselves that this is a very important doctrine. It's not only important in our lives, but it's also important in soul winning with our families, our friends, and the congregation. Let's go ahead and close in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you so much for your message that you laid on my heart, Lord. And most importantly, help us to realize that chastisement is important. That your grace is is it not an excuse for us to go out and sin? That salvation is by faith. It is by grace. It's easy. But once we're your children, well, you're going to reprove us and you're going to hold us accountable as a father does a son here on earth. So thank you for this message. Help us to go out there and do your will, Lord. Help us to go out there and lead many souls to Christ uh, as we go about our business this week. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.